We are going to be in the book of Revelation. If you brought your Bible, have a Bible on device, or there's a Bible somewhere near you under a chair. Revelation's the, the final book of the New Testament. If you want to take notes or draw pictures of a sea beast or an earth beast, that's what we're going to be talking about. Or you write the number 666 on the paper. I know that sounds unholy, but you can do that. Uh, we'll talk about that, that we're going to be in Revelation 13, where we're going to hear about beasts and yes, the number 666, and I'll say it out loud a few more times because I'm not scared of it or anything. Uh, so uh, Revelation 13 is where we're finding ourselves. And, uh, you know, here's the deal. We, we preach through, we teach and preach through books of the Bible. That means we don't skip over sections, which is good and sometimes difficult. And we, we encounter challenging sections. And, and uh, but those are oftentimes sections that... Uh, the ones that we could avoid that, that really can help us, can help us understand God's word and his will deeper. And, and this chapter and this book is one of those, right? Uh, Revelation has been a challenge, Revelation 13, with not one, but two beasts. And yes, the number 666 is, is going to be challenging today. But it's good to be doing it together uh, and to be hearing God's scripture. Uh, and we believe that in doing that, that it's all all of God's scripture is God-breathed, and God, God uses it to teach us and grow us and correct it. And so each time I get to preach with you and worship with you and hear God's word read, um, we're doing something spiritual together. It's an act of worship to, to give a sermon, to hear a sermon. And so we believe that, that God is working, his spirit is working in and through uh, this word that we hear today. And so it's truly a blessing to be with you and to hear God's word together. Let, let's Let's seek him first in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, dear Lord. For you alone, Lord, should we rightly fear. You alone should we fully follow. You alone should our lives be founded upon. You are our rock and redeemer, our author and perfecter. You know what we need to hear. You, you know why you gave this book to your church, why this chapter is revealed to us. So if we come here today never hearing it before or we don't know what it means, Lord, we are trusting that your Holy Spirit can help us and guide us to the truth and to what we need. So I pray that each person would be praying for themselves today, Lord, that they would hear your word today. They really would pray and, and, and have this as an act of worship, an active time with their mind and heart, that they'd be praying for each other, for people sitting nearby or people online who are together, and that they'd pray for me and other preachers, Lord, that we would rightly declare your word and that you would be glorified. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So before we dive into chapter 13, Every once in a while, I've been asking, why Revelation? Before we start our, our message, why Revelation? Why are we study, studying the book of Revelation? The, the simple answer, of course, I've said before, is it's in God's word. It's God's, God's Bible, right? And, and we need to hear from that. But I, I, I want us to consider another simple answer to why Revelation. Uh, it's so that we are blessed. And that can sound selfish to read something so that you are blessed, but actually it was God's idea. God said that if you read or hear the revelation, you will be blessed. And now a lot of people don't think that when they read Revelation, they hear about a dragon or a beast or the end of times, but the book itself in chapter one says that the hearers and the readers and those who put it to practice, the lessons of this book will be blessed. Let me remind us of that in Revelation 1, 3, it says this, how blessed the reader, and this is the, the message paraphrase, I don't use that too much, but uh, I'll read it, 1-3, uh, says, how blessed the reader, how blessed the hearers and keeper, keepers of these oracle words, all the words written in this book, time is just about up. So Revelations chapter 1 says you're blessed if you, you hear it, read it, and put it into practice meaning that this book was meant to be heard by the people of God, uh, meant to be read, and though some don't treat it this way, it's a practical book. There are encouraging lessons. There are things that you can put into your daily life that you learn from Revelation. So I just want to encourage you 
you can be blessed by reading Revelation. So we have about 10 more chapters to go in Revelation. There's 22 chapters entirely. We are not gonna be in this book for years. It's gonna end in the fall, in October, I think. Uh, so time is just about up on our series because October will come here before you know it. Uh, but this is gonna be good for us as we continue in this book together. If you just started with us on this, I encourage you one thing to do is read through the book of Revelation on your own. Uh, and that's how it's meant to be read in one sitting. So try that, and if it, if it befuddles you or amazes you, stuns you, you want to put it down in the middle, keep going. That's part of its effect is to overwhelm you. Uh, I think that's part of God's intention, but so that you can be blessed in the end. All right, all that with introduction. Uh, we're going to dive into chapter 13, reading the whole chapter. We're going to see some beasts who are working for the dragon, and the dragon is Satan or the evil one, and so there's this revealing of future beastly leaders who are going to lead people astray. Let's hear from Revelation chapter 13, starting with verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, all those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, he will be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns, like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, the number of its name, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. All right. Clear as day, right? Oh, okay. Uh, so, does anybody else think it's funny that chapter 13 of Revelation is where we first hear 666, or is that just a preacher thing? Okay, so... Uh, we're going to go verse by verse or section by section through this today. I'm not going to pretend for one moment to be uh, getting to the entire depths of this section. And as we've said through most of Revelation, there's 
different ways to interpret Revelation, and people disagree about it. Good, good people disagree about it. But I hope to draw out some, some general uh, lessons and some lessons that I think God can bless us with. So we see this first beast, right? The, the sea beast rising up. Uh, verse 1 tells us the sea beast. And it, it, it also tells us that it has ten horns and seven heads and seven diadems. This is telling us it has these healthy numbers. Ten and seven are healthy biblical numbers. He, he's portraying health portraying to be a strong leader, portraying to be royalty of sorts or have power, but he is not good, right? He's blaspheming God. He doesn't need God. So maybe it's a leader, you know, uh, in some ultimate way, there'll be a leader like this in the future saying, you have no need for God. But the truth is we've had leaders, beast-like leaders, uh, who are not calling us to relationship with God, but calling us to independence from God. We've had leaders like that throughout human history, right? So there's gonna be beast-like leaders. As Jesus said, there's gonna be many false Christs and many false prophets. He said that in Matthew 24, 24. And there's gonna be many beast-like leaders. And then at the end of times, in some, some way I fully don't understand, there'll be the ultimate earth beast and sea beast, okay? And so we see here the sea beast is, he's like a leopard, he's like a bear, he's, 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 he's like powerful creatures of the earth, like a lion. He's, he also is drawing his authority from the dragon. But he's, he's also an imitator. Verse three tells us that he's wounded but not killed, right? He, he's trying to draw sympathy as this, this powerful leader that is wounded, right? And he's overcome some challenge. Maybe, maybe it was some disability or some, some wounding from another party. I, I don't know. But he's, he's overcome that and he draws attention to it. But it's also, it's also mocking or pretending to, to do what our Lord, our, the Lamb of God, really did. He was truly slain and, and, and overcame that, was resurrected. And so this... This false leader of the future and leaders like him in the present is drawing attention to how he overcame some, some wound of one type or another. And he uses his speech to insult God. He, we, we see him insulting, throwing blasphemies upon God. You can see that in verses 5 and 6. He's insulting God and God's heaven and God's inhabitants. And, 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 and no... no no wonder, I mean, they, we read earlier in a previous chapter, chapter 12, about how the angels beat up on the dragon and really the, the evil leader of the, the beast had been beaten up. So they, they don't really like heaven. They don't like God. They don't like the forces that work from God. They're, they're, they're against God getting glory, okay? Now, verse seven, all these verses are challenging, but verse seven is difficult because it tells us that, that the, this evil leader is going to be making war on the saints or the people of God. Not just the holy all-stars, that's what some people think of when they hear saints, but saints is New Testament language for any pe person that's been forgiven in Christ. So if you have believed in Jesus Christ, you are made holy, you're forgiven, you are a saint, and that means that he can make war on you, right? And he's trying to conquer the saints of God, the people of God. And he is allowed authority in the world to do that. And verse 8 tells us that it's, it's all who dwell on earth could be, could be misled or, or lured into worshiping this, this beast, right? Except we, we, hear, we hear that it, it won't be those who are written in the Lamb's book of life the lamb who was slain for the world, the true one who was mortally wounded, fatally wounded, died for us. If, if we're his, we are not going to be led astray. We're not gonna worship the, this false leader, right? So verse nine tells us, let us hear this, right? If anyone has an ear, let him hear. That's something Jesus said a lot. Like, are you really paying attention? Do you know, Christians, you could get misled by earthly leaders? Are we aware of that? I hope, right? Or are you pretty sure that all the leaders you've always followed are just the perfect leader, right? And that the way they drum up sympathy, sympathy or fundraising is always just holy and pure. No, Christians, do you hear, right? That, that he would, he would, the evil forces in this world would draw away even God's people if, if they could. But God's going to protect his people. So it's important that we listen. And I don't know about you, I... I I have a couple of listening problems, at least. Tina's told me of them. I didn't listen to her, so I, uh, but I, ha I have selective listening, right, where I hear what I want to hear. Does anybody have that problem, or am I the only one? No? Okay. So I hear what I want to hear, and then later on they said, no, that's not what was said. And then I have assumptive listening. That's a little bit different, right, assumptive listening, 
whereas I assume something was said that wasn't even said. So that's a little bit different than selective listening because I assume you said that because just everybody should agree with me or whatever it is, right? And so we have, we have listening. We do this with our politics, with our money, with, with our, our faith sometimes. We, we, we don't really listen maybe to other people, to God's word. Really listen and tune in. We, we sometimes don't want to hear the hard things like, hey, are you listening? That's one thing I tune out sometimes. Or, hey, Corey, are you paying attention? You know, don't let that habit creep back into your life. Whatever it is, right? Are we listeners to God? Who are we listening to? Are we listening to worldly leaders more than we're listening to our God as leader? So the verse 10 gives us the straight up truth that there's going to be a battle. And this is one of many phrases in Revelation that just straight up tells us that God's people God's people will go through hard things in the end times. And I know there's different interpretations of who's on planet Earth when some of this stuff happens, but I'll tell you what, uh, the scriptures are clear uh, that God's people are allowed to suffer, right? And he, this is like it put in the form of a poem, maybe even a song. Could you imagine singing this with joy? Hey, if we're to be taken captive to captivity, we go and... Uh, and if we're to be killed with the sword, then with the sword we are slain. But this is the attitude that they had. This is a call for endurance, they said. This is, Jesus is saying, let this encourage you. Have courage. Now, let's think about that, the psychology of that. If you are living in a community of faith back then or in many places in the world today and your friends and family are captured for being a follower of Jesus or they are killed, one of the things that evil would try to get you to think is God has abandoned you or there is no God because look, they've taken you captive. They killed this one or that one. But if God comes back in his word and tells us, hey, if you're taken captive, if you're killed, remember, that's what I said would happen. There's an evil force against you. It's not proof of my abandonment. Your name is in my book of life, and it's been there since the foundation, before the foundation of the world. All right. Let's look at the beast number two, the earth beast, verse 11 tells us. And he's also trying to pretend to be like the lamb. The other one had a wound that was healed, you know, trying to get sympathy. But this one has lamb-like horns, but, you know, but he's not... He doesn't speak the language of the lamb. He doesn't speak the kind, merciful language of our Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks the language of the dragon. The, Jesus says that the native language of Satan is lies, is manipulation, right? Jesus told us that there will be leaders who are, are really wolves, but they're, they're in sheep's clothing, right? So they will pretend to have, you know, the cute little lamb. But, but what does their speech say? What does the fruit say? Are they really kind? Are they merciful? Are they gracious? Are they, giving, are they giving God glory? This one is not, right? Verse 12 uh, tells us that these beasts are in some way working together. And, and, and you know, I've thought about this a lot. I, I don't know what it's going to be like exactly the end time, but it, obviously they're, gonna, they're working together. They don't want God to get glory. They want the evil one to get glory. They're a one-two punch. And, and uh, I couldn't help but think of the Republicans and Democrats. I'm so sorry. I don't want this to be a political message, but it's so funny to me. They're so different, right? And they go more extreme all the time. But in the end, if you give your loyalty and your effort and your money all to that, and you really think that that is how people's lives are going to be changed, and I'm not saying that there isn't some reason for political effort and so forth in your convictions, but, but if you get lured into the idea that that is really the hope of the world, one party or another, it ends up that the evil one can work through all these parties, right? It can work through, through different sides of battles. It could, it, it, it can, it could, they could be a one-two punch and actually be opposing each other but working for the same end. Do you see what I'm saying? So sometimes we, we, we think we're on the holy side of a worldly movement. But I think one of the things Revelation challenges us to say is, is, is the movement we're a part of, is the leader we're looking at driving us to, to faith and to more love for neighbor? Or is it increasing my fear and anxiety and my distrust of neighbor, right? Is it increasing division and contempt? And I, I would say a lot of our worldly parties, they, they have different ideals, but a lot of times they fundraise, and how do they do it? By increasing division and contempt. 
contempt on the other side, right? And they're not increasing love for neighbor and glory for God, so maybe they're just a one-two punch not working for God at all. Something to think about, right? And I think, you know, this, this whole thing we went through, I don't, I don't know if you went through it too, the whole COVID-19 pandemic, do you hear about that, right? Uh, and maybe you heard that. Uh, so all those shutdowns and all the different things and people go on different sides of different issues and I'm not here to, to, to do any of that, but boy, there is a force of evil that likes to divide people and keep people from loving God and loving neighbor, Right? And so we'll remember the beginning of the pandemic where for a brief time we wanted to take care of each other until we found good things we could fight about and then we're like, oh yeah, we like that more, right? Kind of reminded me of the Garden of Eden. It's like, oh, they're together and then they fight and before you know it, a brother's killing a brother and they're outside the garden, of course, at that point. But, you know, it's just... It's just a weird thing that happens to us as human beings, and I think Revelation is trying to tell us this. We, we, we can easily get misled by our leader of choice that, that can end up telling us to be more like beasts than, than the image of God that's in us. And we can start reading a false Bible that's not the actual Bible, but it's our, our preferred media outlet, whatever that is. And, you know, I think a lot of people did that during the pandemic. Whatever your preferred media outlet was, that became, for some people, their holy scriptures of how they then interpreted the rest of life, right? And the prayer book became whatever their social media was. And, then, and before you know it, we have people that are using media and social media more than the Bible and prayer books. And it's no wonder to me now that nationally in the United States of America, depends on the region you're in, but f- we're down 40 to 60% in worship attendance of people who are regularly worshiping. Division and contempt, and I'm not picking on one side or another here at all. I'm just picking on that leader who picked on us and we bought into some of the lies and before you know it, we, we were weakened for it, Right? And so whether some people drifted and made heroes out of QAnon or Antifa or one party or another, the truth was some, there's some stuff in e- all of those movements that were really working for the same team called evil the whole time. <clears throat> anyway, let's get off that, okay? Verse 13 says that these leaders that will come through history and these leaders of the future will be able to do great signs, even making fire come down from heaven. Uh, And that's interesting. I mean, Matthew 7, Jesus says that there will be people that he will tell them he doesn't know them. They think they will be followers of the Lord and he's gonna say, I don't know you. And then one of the things they're gonna say back to him is, but we did miracles in your name, right? So there's gonna be people so deluded or, you know, that they are thinking that they are doing things in the name of Christianity or in the name of Christ, but Jesus is gonna to have to say to them, no, you were actually on your own ego trip there, and yeah, you did something that was spiritual, but that wasn't my spirit. And Revelation wants us to be aware of that, right? That there are spiritual forces that can do impressive things uh, that are not from God. And verse 14 tells us this as well, right? That these people will be impressed and will lead them to false worship of the beast. They'll see these signs and, and they'll buy into the leadership. They'll see, you know, great captains of industry or great political leaders that are, and they'll just buy into that and they'll go and they'll follow them. And you think, no, we're not that naive, Corey. Well, it happens, right? It happens throughout history. We could just look at 20th century Europe and, People bought into all kinds of leadership that killed millions and millions of people, right? People want to make their human leaders into spiritual heroes, and that is very dangerous. Always has been, always will be. Our spiritual hero is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we make human leaders into an image of that, when we try to breathe the breath of God into a human image and make a human closer to God than they ever could be, it's dangerous, right? Whether that's the Cuban Castro or the Pharaoh of Egypt of old, it it, it ends up leading into people getting hurt. Whether that's Germans crying Heil Hitler, right? 
or whether it's ancient times, Romans shouting, Caesar is Lord and willing to kill strangers or whoever to promote the peace of Rome, right? Be careful, this image tells us, because people, verse 15, are gonna try to breathe image or they're going to be part of a movement where one beast is breathing in the image to the other beast and, and it's interesting that the romans of the ancient times who these citizens of rome and, and people who lived in rome who heard this book the first time they probably would have been thinking of images and statues of the emperors and that was their that was their artwork back then right the statues they've seen and, and they're trying to be impressed to to give loyal worship to the emperor and the empire so there's a, there's a desire, verse 16 tells us, there's this desire for evil forces to control human beings and to mark us out stamped with the image of evil, right? To stamp the image of an evil identity upon us. And I know there's been so much talk about what is this evil image stamp and you know, maybe you've seen weird artwork of 666 or maybe a barcode on somebody's forehead or something weird like that or maybe you think it's going to be a microchip from bill gates in your neck or something I, you know but i think what's being said here is a bigger story that connects to the whole bible all right god is wanting to restore the image of god that's been stamped onto every human being but that's been covered up and marred by sin and brokenness right and he's wanting to restore that to make us whole, wholeness. The, the, the Old Testament word for that is shalom. He wants to restore deep peace or wholeness with humanity. Clean up, wipe that, that dirty, marred image clean by the blood of Jesus Christ and make us whole. But there is another force, the serpent that was in the garden and the other forces in this world that are wanting to not have us have that restored image. Indeed, want us to have an image of, of selfishness, of, of, of ego, right? I heard one preacher say this week, ego stands for edging God out, right? I think we're edging God out in our culture. We, 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 some are proud to be stamped with the idea of I don't need God, right? And so we see here in summary in verses 16 and then 17 and 18, this, this battle between the stamps or the images of there are some, there are many who are going to have the image on their hand and on their forehead, meaning they're, they're going to be marked as self-independent human beings who don't need God. And they're gonna be in cultures who, who promote that. And that's the, you know, in some places, Saudi Arabia today, this verse is very true, literally true. You can't be a Saudi Arabian citizen and then of conscience wake up one morning and say, I think Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You can, actually, I mean, you can do that. If it's found out, you'll get arrested and then the, the penalty is death. You cannot be a Saudi Arabian citizen and follow Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Well, you can until they kill you, right? And so you can't do business. You can't do anything, right? Unless you have the right mark. But there's different ways humans have done this mark, whether, whether it's other religions or other, you know, ethnic games with ethnicity or whatever. We, we don't need to get into all that. But let's talk about this mark for a bit, the 666. This game that's been played, there's so many number and name games that have been played with this. Some of you may even be nervous with this number up there, so we'll just go ahead and cross it out. Boom, okay. Uh, so a game has been played uh, with 666 called Gamatria, and they take these verses and they say, oh, it says if you have wisdom, you should calculate the number, and so we should figure out which, what name equals 666. And so people have been doing this for a long time. And, and basically, you, could, you know, I read several commentaries this week. and It depends on which commentary you read. And if you start in Greek, if you start in Hebrew, if you want to use a little bit of Latin, you want to use English, you could end up thinking Ronald uh, Wilson Reagan was 666 and one of the beasts. Or, or some people made an argument for Bill Clinton, right? You could s see uh, Nero Caesar, one of the bad emperors of Rome, is the 666 f fulfillment. But then if you look at other scholars that say, if you do whatever math in the right gymnastics, you can have about the you know, eight emperors in a row. You know? So I think all of that is not what the scripture is saying by calculate the number. 666 is, is a pretending number. Okay, what do I mean by that? It's just like some of these descriptions we've heard of the beast. He had a wound, but he was healed. He's trying to be like the lamb who was slain, but he's not really. He wasn't willing to make the full sacrifice 
Evil is selfish, right? He had horns like the lamb, but he's not the lamb. He spoke like the dragon. He's 666, and he wants to mark the people with 666. Six is six-sevenths of seven, right? Seven is the perfect number. Each of these six is, is just one off of seven. Seven is the number of perfection. And so this looks like a lot off because we know math, and it's 111 off of 777. But the idea here is it's one off, one off, one off. What if you just one day off, one minute off, one, one off, one off, one That's not that much, right? What's one little sin, one thing, right? This is what evil wants you to think, right? The, that the pretending is good enough. The going to church but never really believing is good enough, right? No, pretending is evil. Pretending to love your neighbor is not the same as loving your neighbor. Pretending to love God is not the same as loving God. That's pretty obvious. But what this is saying is there's going to be people out there that, that are just doing their religion or just doing their, their worldly life to be liked by people or, or whatever, but they're not really of Christ. They're not marked with the image of the Lamb, 777, the perfect mark. This, this, this number actually makes a lot more sense when you keep reading uh, and, and read verse uh, one of chapter 14 where it says, then I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So what we're actually made for is to have the name of God upon us, right? The new name, the perfect name to be claimed by the one who made us. But evil would have us to, to fall for a substitute, to think that life is just about this life now, to think life is just about your pursuits, right? But that is so far short of what it is. So a lot of false belief is just a little bit off, one off, one off, one off. There's a lot of good moral ways to live life, but they end up actually being selfish. And the scriptures want us to think about that. And evil wants us to question the trustworthiness of God's perfection, wants to blaspheme God, insult God, insult God's leadership and provide a substitute leader and invite us into being a substitute version of ourselves instead of our whole, full, restored, fully forgiven self. Don't settle for the substitute. That's the real lesson of 666. Don't, so one of the ways you can cannot settle for the substitute is don't turn revelation into something it isn't. A code book right, to find messages that aren't really there. The message that is there is turn to Christ, follow Christ, be willing to die for Christ. Don't don't settle for any imposter. Live to follow the lamb who was slain. Live to follow the lamb who was slain, right? Depending on how your verse eight was translated, some of you might have it that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, or some of you might have it that, that your names were written in the lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. The truth is that this is an amb- ambiguous sentence and translators don't know quite what to do with it because the statement in the middle, the before the foundation of the world, seems to be able to be applied to either phrase. And I'm actually okay with that ambiguity because what it means is the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world was slain for me and in some marvelous way that my little pitiful brain can't handle, that means that I was in his book of life before the foundation of the world too. Before I was knit together in my mother's womb, he was planning to save me. And that is grace, right? God knows the end from the beginning and it's majestic, it's beautiful. It doesn't take away our freedom to know that, right? To know that he was willing to pay the price before I was even born. He's the God that knew that there had to be this way for humans to be, to be freed from sin. He knew that he wanted to create free beings who could freely love one another and freely worship God, but he knew we would abuse our freedom and that we would fall short and that our image would get marked over and broken. And so he knew to save us, us beings and to come and forgive us and restore that image, he had to come himself to wipe us clean and make us new so that we would freely choose to surrender to him and be made new. He knew that the moment he decided to create us before the foundation of the world. He knew what it would take to rescue us. He knew that it would take physical suffering because he really had to come and be one of us. He knew that it would take great spiritual suffering beyond our imagination. He knew that before he even 
put your atoms all together in your body. Isn't that mind-blowing? And he doesn't force our allegiance. He just says, I want you to see this and choose freely to love me. He's not gonna be a tyrant who manipulates us. He is the king who dies for us. There's been so many tyrants that have come and gone in world history who are gonna use power and manipulation and evil speech and threats and and intimidation and, and false sympathy. I was wounded, look at me, right? But they're not gonna be like the lamb who is God and was involved in creation but gave himself up and became a servant and died on the cross for us knowing all the while that it would be his creatures that would do that to him. I submit to you that God is the freest being there is. He didn't have to heal our disobedience. He freely wants to. And if God is the being who freely wants to heal your disobedience, your broken, even, brokenness, even the stuff you did this week, this month, or the stuff you're not proud of in your past, He knew that before the foundation of the world and wanted to freely die for you anyways. So don't ever doubt the love of God for you. That's what Revelation 13 tells me. This is a lesson that you will be blessed if you put it into practice in your life. There will be some time where the evil voice will tell you to doubt God's love for you and you can come back with Revelation 13 and say, but the Lamb of God was slain for me before the foundation of the world. So yeah, I fell short but he loves me, and that can't be undone. So don't ever doubt the love of God for you. And if you do, just tell yourself the truth that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, was slain before the foundation of the world for you. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how religious you've been in the past or anything like that. Our God, the true God, who is not an imposter, but the real God who became a full flesh and blood human being while still being in identity, the Son of God, gave himself for you. And he wasn't just wounded with a show of a wounding. wounding. He was dead. He was fully dead and in the grave for you to take your death upon himself. He fully, really, truly did experience death and put your death to death with his death. So beware of anybody who's trying to lead you away from that hope. Beware of false Christs and false prophets. Beware of political leaders, thought leaders, authors, even religious leaders that will seem to be good and kind, and some will even seem to have miraculous abilities, but if they are not leading you to the lamb who was slain, they are out for themselves. If they are not leading you to live like one who lives like the lamb, to love God and love others, then they are out for themselves. Beware. And I cannot count in my life That's not too terribly long of a life, right? I just think of all the fallen and false religious political, religious and political leaders I've seen, right? That were supposedly good, and people put their hopes in their solutions only to be made fools or bankrupt. Our hope must be in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his faithfulness. Not in any party, not in any politician, not in any building, not in any philosophy, not in any priest or pastor. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, the Lamb who is the eternal Son of God. Okay, so simply this. I want to end with saying what the scriptures say. Have endurance and have faith. Pretty basic, right? You might get captive, and you'll think, unlikely here. Well, you might get a condition where your mind just starts deteriorating and your body is held captive to your deteriorating mind. Or your body deteriorates and your mind stays fine and your mind is held captive to a deteriorating body. You might get captive. You might get captive to a family situation that's broken and you don't know how to escape the brokenness of it. You don't know how to share your faith with somebody who rejects it. You might get captive in future times for just being a Christian. I don't know. You might get killed. You might die. You will die. You might die for sharing your faith. So cheer up, right? That's one of the things we've been saying in Revelation. Cheer up, church. It's worse off than you think. Said that in one of the earlier messages. That's a Charlie Peacock lyric. It really is. That's what Revelation is sharing. So have endurance, have faith. Because of this, nothing can undo what the Lamb of God has done for you. Nothing. 
So troubles may come, and they may look beastly and scary. Or they may seem strangely alluring and good, like, oh, this leader's the hope. Whatever comes, shiny or you know what, follow the Lamb, who is true no matter what. For our Lamb, our Lord, is complete and perfect. He is the opposite of 666. He's not one-off, one-off, one-off. He's perfect, perfect, perfect. As Revelation has said already, we've heard it before, He is holy, holy, holy. There is no one worthy to open up this beautiful plan except the Lamb of God who was willing to suffer for us. So if you want to avoid falling for a false leader in the future, or again, if you've already fallen for one in the past, there is one simple solution. Just follow the true lamb with all your heart. And all the worldly stuff, don't give allegiance to. Maybe support things here and there, but know that your hope is in Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Worship him regularly. Pray to him all the time, and it'll sort itself out. Lord God, Thank you for being the ultimate true leader. We don't know all the details of what's coming, but we know you do. And we know you know the beginning from the end, and you are good and in control, and your word is true. And we know that evil would want to mislead even your people if it, if it was allowed to. So Lord, help us to hear. Help us to be wise. Help us to follow you with all our hearts. Help us to not edge you out and to settle for something less than you. For we were made for a relationship with you and no substitute will satisfy. Thank you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of next steps. Um, We're thinking about doing a big event at the end of Revelation. We're just starting to seed this idea of called a Revelation Read event. Got a rogue quotation mark there. But um, uh, we're basically going to have a worship service where we have an opening prayer and just revelation is read straight through by di- a few different readers without comment, just to hear it all at once together in a congregational event. So if you're interested in that, I'm just kind of polling people. And then next, uh, if you would like prayer for your endurance and faith, uh, I'd be glad to do that. So let's pray for one another for our endurance and faith.